we're so happy to have you back, like we said, and uh, we have a lot going on with COVID, right? It's a whole, almost a whole year later, and it seems like, you know, though we have some knowledge about the virus and the way it works, there's a lot of knowledge gaps now because of the mutations. And so during our conversation last December, you did warn us um, of the potential for mutations, and now there are our reality. I know that COVID numbers have gone up in the U.S. and a lot of cities because of the introduction of these mutations. Um, but really, can you explain just one more time uh, how and why viruses mutate in the first place? Yeah. So I think the one good thing is that we expected mutations. Um, that doesn't make everybody else feel comfortable because once they're here, you don't know what to do with them exactly. But viruses are always are always mutating. It's kind of part of their process. And the reason for this is that, you know, they're usually switching from hosts, they're changing locations. Um, and so there's opportunity for them to change as they replicate. And the way, like the, the basic way that viruses work is that they require a host, as in they require either a human or an animal. Um, to replicate and to survive. So in order for them to cause infection, they need to be able to get into the host and the host uses its own machinery. So whatever is already in our system to replicate the, the genes or the genetic material of the virus, which is typically what's called RNA. Um, and so when we encode that and we replicate that within our system, as you can imagine, the more copies you make, the more uh, opportunity for error exists. So every time we make a copy, there's a possibility that there's going to be a small mismatch in some of that genes or some of those genes that are being encoded. And so what happens is most of the time, these changes are minimal um, and they don't really affect the overall functionality of the virus, as in they don't change how it um, invades, it doesn't change how it transmits. And so we can usually just kind of, you know, ignore them, not a big deal. The issue becomes is if a mutation occurs in a certain part of that RNA process or in a certain like foundational building block, then you can kind of get um, a virus that is changing how it actually functions. So you get a new form that can either be more um, contagious or can be more severe. Uh, and the reason, like the way I like to explain this is that, so mutations themselves, because there's a lot of terminology that people are throwing around and it gets really confusing, but mutations are the changes that we see during the replication process that are different, right? Um, and a virus with these mutations is labeled as a variant, meaning it's different than before. So it has a mutation in it. Now, what becomes an issue is when we see these variants start having not only a small structural difference, but they behave differently. And when they start behaving differently, or they start having their own kind of distinct physical behavior, we refer to them as strains. Um, and you'll hear these two words kind of thrown around, like interchangeably most of the time people will say variant, they'll say strains. So for example, the UK, the Brazilian, all those, they're variants, but they're also strains because they function differently than the original virus did. Um, and that's how that distinction is. So basically all strains are variants, but not all variants are gonna be strains. Um, and that's kind of just how you simplify the terms that you are gonna hear when referring to these things. I just had, I don't know if you did too, Mary, I just had like a moment because I was struggling over the right terminology to use for my next question, which you, you so beautifully touched mm -hmm. on, which is more specifically, you know, can you share how the UK, South African, Brazilian strains differ? But I, again, I didn't know if strains was the right term. And I went back and forth. That's and totally right. Understand if I'm using the right word. And so that made so much sense. Again, yeah. because they're strains, if I understand you correctly, they have manif they manifest in, in different ways physically. And so mm -hmm. can you talk about some of the differences um, between those strains and you know the original COVID virus? Yeah. So there's still a lot of work being done on the strains because they're relatively new, but for example, the UK strain itself. So we know that there's a mutation on the spike protein and the spike protein is kind of what helps it get into the host cell. Um, and so the thought there is that it, that change has made it easier for it to kind of get into us, get into our cells um, and function. And therefore it's making it more contagious because it's entering more and so they can replicate more. And so it's more easily transmissible. Um, and so we know that the UK virus is now the dominant strain in the UK. And the thought is that it's gonna become the dominant strain in the US. 
um, at some point as well. And that's just because it's a little bit more virulent in the sense that it's more contagious. Originally, when uh, it came out, there was no thought that it was going to be more severe or cause more like death or anything like that. I think now we're starting to think maybe it is a little bit more severe, but there really has been no large scale epidemiological studies to kind of prove that uh, hypothesis. Um, and it's also possible that because it's more contagious and because more people are getting it, we're just seeing more people in the hospital, meaning we might see more deaths, we might see people more severely ill. So it's still kind of unclear in that standpoint. Um, the South African strain has also been seen to be more transmissible because it also has a mutation on the spike protein, but there's also some other mutations in it that the theory is it might make it harder for our antibodies to kind of uh, respond to it or to kind of like, you know, uh, recognize it. Um, and so the thought there is that, you know, we are seeing these things, but again, we don't have any large scale evidence of it, but there has been no thought yet that it's causing more severity or more or worse symptoms than the other ones. Um, and the Brazilian one is probably the one we actually know the least about. Again, there's a theoretical thought that it is more transmissible, but we just haven't had enough experience with it yet to really see what its mutations are gonna lead to and how it's gonna interact with us in general. Um, so those are kind of the main strains that people are talking about. So this um, leads me to a question around, because this is a global pandemic, are we, are we seeing more strands because it's affecting more people around the globe and our bodies, you know, kind of adapt to the viruses that we experience in our country. And so um, it may respond to a virus differently. And, but this virus is affecting everybody so we're seeing variants that are strands that um, we might not have been affected by because it's more global. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah. I, I feel like there's a global aspect to yeah. this that we have not seen with anything else. I think the the simple way of putting it is that because it's a pandemic and that so many people are getting it, we're giving it more and more opportunities to mutate, right? So if the more we get it, the more we're replicating, the more our body's replicating, the more likely we are to have changes, the more likely we are to get mutations that eventually manifest into something that's a different strain. So I think really that's the idea behind it is that this just the more people, like the more spread we have, the more possibility of it mutating becomes. Um, and I think that's the thing with how that changes overall. And again, I think, you know, the fact that we, people travel, it's jumping from person to person in different location, different location. It just provides the opportunity for it to change and evolve as it continues. So along with what Mary's saying, because, you know, we have, even in COVID, we still have uh, people on flights and moving and traveling, not only within our borders, but across borders. Um, and not all of us, you know, are at the point where we've been vaccinated, um, even with the first dose. How will the efficacy of the vaccines that are on the market globally be affected by the presence of these different strains? Mm -hmm. Are scientists developing a booster already? Because they're thinking that um, we might need to uh, address these strains uh, more specifically. How, what, do you, what do you think science are working on in terms of um, trying to protect us as these strains arise? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we already know with Pfizer and Moderna, they have evidence that their vaccine works well and pretty, I mean, really well against the UK variant. The same idea with Novavax, Johnson Johnson, AstraZeneca, they all see similar good efficacy with the UK. The issues become when we switch to the South African variant. So Moderna and Pfizer have shown decent effectiveness against it. Um, Novavax reported about 60% effectiveness against the South African variant and Johnson & Johnson reported 57% and AstraZeneca still doesn't have enough data to really know how effective it is. Um, so we obviously already see a decrease in effectiveness, but that doesn't mean it's completely not going to work um, at all. There's still, there's definitely some protection still. 
Um, and with the Brazilian one, we, we don't really know yet how our vaccines are going to work against that. So, you know, even though there is reduced efficacy, the more, depending on the strain, it isn't, it isn't like you're starting from scratch. There's still going to be some usefulness in the vaccine that you get. Um, and in order to cover the variants, yeah, so I believe that both Moderna and Pfizer are working on boosters. The benefit of having an mRNA vaccine is that to change it, it's really just a small tweak in almost like a computer program. It's not like they're starting from scratch. They don't have to go through all these like steps and studies anymore. They're really just making a small change in the genetic coding. And then that can help uh, switch over and cover the other variants as a thought process. So they're working on these boosters um, currently, I believe. I don't know how far along in the process they are, but they're, we're definitely out there. People are working on that. And for the ones that are still being tested, obviously, I, they don't think they can, I don't think they can even start a booster process until they know their original vaccine is effective in whatever area they're testing it in. One question I have, and I, I don't know if we'll get to this later, but uh, actually, now that more people are getting the vaccine, well, maybe not. I'm just curious if there's any more data on some of the areas where we didn't have a lot of data, like women who are pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, now that the vaccine is being administered, do we have any updated information on that? Yeah, not that I know from the ones that are actually getting vaccinated with Moderna and Pfizer. There are studies that are started that are being done on pregnant people, um, but we just don't have the clear evidence from that yet that I have seen. And to the same uh, respect, what about the uh, like below 18? Yeah, same same idea. So I think Johnson Johnson was doing was going to do a study in children below the age of eighteen. Um, so I think they're all in the works, at least in their phases. Um, but none of that has been has been published that I have at least been aware of. And obviously, I'm biased because I'm an adult doctor, so I get very little children's data. Um, but I all of them are definitely in the process because obviously these are important populations that we need to study it in. And now that we have enough evidence from adults, I think people are going to focus more on these small pockets and feel safer conducting those studies. Mary, in that same vein, I was thinking about uh, my friend who's an ER doctor. She just had a baby in November and she's still breastfeeding, but she received both doses of the mm -hmm. vaccine and she, she's been breastfeeding. So, so the thought would be that her baby, right, um, through the breast milk, I guess, has, you know, been exposed to the vaccine. Um, but have our scientists doing research on that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, the, the vaccines that we have now, the mRNA, uh, the reason that originally people didn't have or were saying that they felt that it was likely safe for breastfeeding people or pregnant people to get them is that, you know, they're not, we don't think that they would affect a fetus or a child in any way. Now, as far as antibody protection, I think those studies are also something that's going to be done. But again, we've had such a little population of those getting vaccinated. It's really just the healthcare workers, right? Um, so getting that data over time is going to take a while. But I think it is important to look at because we don't really know what the transmission of that immunity would even look like. I think you gave us so much food for thought. Just understanding the science <laughs> behind the strains and how they might affect, again, the science of vaccines. Um, and it brings me back to pieces of our conversation in December again, where you told us quite candidly how we could protect ourselves and gave us some real tips. So now that we're here with these mutations, what can we do? I mean, I hear things like wear three masks, <laughs> not one. Um, yeah. what, what are the best practices for us right now living in the mutation COVID world? Yeah. I mean, I think the focus is still the same, right? I still think that there's, not, there's nothing that these mutations are going to change in how we behave as far as protection. Masks should still be worn. Right now, the CDC recommendation is to wear a mask that has at least two fabric layers, meaning you know it's not just like one thin piece of fabric, but two breathable fabrics. 
um, or wearing the regular masks that people wear in the hospital, not the N95s, obviously, because those product that production is difficult and that should be left for people who are in healthcare who have long sustained visits with COVID patients. But you know, the other masks that people are buying with the two or three ply, I know there's like been a lot of stuff about three masks, two masks. I mean, the idea is at the end of the day, if you're wearing five masks and none of them fit you, they're not doing their job, right? So if you have one mask that you can fit around your face, that you have a good seal, then that's better than you trying to put three ill-fitting masks on. Um, and so that's what you're really looking for. That's where that protection is going to be. Avoiding masks that have valves or vents on them because that's not beneficial, right? So we don't want to use those. Thinking that face shields replace masks. Again, not a thing. If you're going to wear a face shield, you still need to wear a mask. Yes, theoretically, maybe that face shield will provide some protection, but you're still kind of open and leaking under. And so you want to get a good seal around your nose and mouth. And obviously, just keeping your mask on appropriately. I still see a lot of people wearing it under their nose, right? And that is not helpful. You need to have it fit, you need it over your nose, you need it over your mouth, um, and you need to continue those practices. So for me, I'm not so much concerned about like how many masks you're wearing or what type. I just wanna make sure that you're actually covered and then you're not leaking air everywhere. So, you know, do like a birthday candle test. Like if you can blow out the birthday candle, your mask is not working, right? You need something to cover you and prevent you from having that air be exposed. Um, and then social distancing is the same. Like you wanna stay far away from people. You wanna limit your outdoor activities and indoor activities in large groups. You don't want to participate with a bunch of people in your space. You still wanna kind of do the exact same things that we were doing before. Because again, slowing the spread of the virus will also slow down mutations of the virus. Um, and I think that would bring people more comfort. So if you don't let it replicate and we're not spreading it, then we're gonna decrease the chances that we're gonna get more and more mutations that are causing issues. How do we work out? Yeah, with a mask. Um, it is hard. And I've not die. <laughs> yeah. So um, I actually, this is just me. I breathe through my mouth when I'm exercising with a mask because if I try to breathe through my nose, I feel like I'm like, oh, I get a headache because my head is tiny. Um, but really your oxygenation is not affected by your mask wearing. It just feels uncomfortable because now you feel like you're breathing under your blanket, right? Or there's something on your face that you're sucking in every time you take a deep breath. You're like, oh my God, there's mask in my mouth. Um, but if that is either exercise at home where you don't have to wear a mask, you know, online programs, what you can do, or if you're going outside and running, you know, pick a time where there's not a lot of people and then you might have the opportunity to not have to wear a mask while you're running if you're outside and no one is around you. And if you're going to a gym, then there's really no way around that other than wearing a good fitting mask. Um, and really, if the mask is like getting soaked through with sweat, you should switch that mask because you want it to still maintain its integrity. Um, and so you don't want your mask to be completely like soiled because then it's not going to be as beneficial. Um, and it's a pain and I get that. I'm with you. It kills my soul too, but it's the only way, especially since we're breathing heavy and like, you know, you're like, oh, I can expel these things around people. So let me just try to keep my, my fluids and my moisture in one location. Yeah, I've, I've, I do it outside, even though it's 20 degrees out and we're six feet apart and because I just can't. Yeah, I, I can't. Um, if I'm really going to work out, it's it's just not going to work. It's absolutely yeah. very difficult. Yeah. And so in that same vein, how do you navigate conversations with your family, your pod, your community when people have received the vaccine in, you know, different doses? or have not. So for instance, I live in what I call a mixed household. My mother-in-law and my husband both have received uh, both doses of their vaccines and I have not received a vaccine. And so our sort of, uh, you know, norm is that everybody wears masks doing certain activities and nothing has changed. Do you recommend that? Um, particularly for those who feel like, you know, I've gotten both doses, I don't need to be as cautious. Um, where are you when it comes to developing best practices as we get vaccinated? Yeah, I think even now, while we're all vaccinated, we still should be wearing masks. I don't see a reason just because you're vaccinated or not. And the reason for that is, while we know that the vaccines protect against you getting sick, right? Like getting ill from the virus, 
we do not know 100% whether it protects you from actually still carrying the virus and just not being symptomatic, right? So we heard a lot about asymptomatic carriers in the past. And the thought is the same with the vaccine is we just don't know yet if you can still have the virus on board and whether you can transmit it. Now, there are some small studies coming out now saying that the transmission rate in those who are vaccinated is super, super low, which is what we would expect, right? If you're not getting sick and the virus isn't replicating and you're not getting terrible and you're not coughing off virus or, you know, sniffling virus on everybody, then yeah, you're probably not spreading it. Um, but again, you still don't want to risk that. And so you want to keep that mask on in case anything that is there, it stays below in that mask. You still want to wash your hands in case you're touching your face and you may have something there and you don't want to spread it. So I still practice exactly the same even after my vaccinations. I still wear a mask everywhere I go. I still only hang out with my pod and my entire pod is vaccinated as well. We all have our two doses, um, but we're still doing the same. I would still get tested if I was coming back from travel. I would still quarantine if I thought I was exposed. Um, and again, all of this is just extra safe best practices because we don't know yet. And it doesn't really hurt to be extra safe, but it does hurt when we start getting sloppy. Um, and so my thought, and I think it's, you know, it's also would be super unfair for some people to be like running around maskless outside because we're not vaccinated. It's just like, until we can all live that same life, we should all be behaving in a similar manner. So just pretty simple. My mom's got both of her vaccine shots. She wants to come visit mm -hmm. from Florida on the plane. You know, she'll wear her masks and everything. How can we be safe in our home with her and the kids? Yeah. So I would say for people who are traveling, um, it's going to be dependent. So if they're staying with you in the home, once they, the recommendation is that if you are traveling and so your exposure was that travel, you should wait five days from your exposure to get tested, to make sure that there's nothing going on. Because if you get tested right away, it just might not have given time for that virus to be present. So the recommendation is if you're traveling, you wanna wait five to seven days after traveling to get tested. And then if that test is negative, then you're good to go. Um, and so, you know, what my sister did recently, she went, she moved back home. So she went from California back home. She wore a mask at home until she was able to get tested towards that time. And once her test came back negative, she took off her mask and then they were all kind of similarly together. So that is the recommendation is to wear a mask until or quarantine in a separate room until you can get that test. Now, obviously, that's easier said than done, because once you walk in the door, you want to hug your grandchildren, you want to hug your friends and family. And, you know, again, the likelihood of someone who is vaccinated with two doses transmitting is lower, um, but it just depends on the risk that, you know, you want to take as a family and as a group. But my recommendation to make everybody comfortable would be just to keep that mask on. Um, until they get a test five days after their trip. That's going to be an interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, not everyone is going to do that. Old, yeah. I think it's going to be tough, right? When you not have families, it's so hard. Well, yeah. And not just families, but like I, the intergenerational piece, like the younger person telling the older person, like, you got to uh -huh. do this to see me. And mm -hmm. it never, it doesn't come across well unless you really sit and try to think of the way you explain it, right? It's tough. These conversations are definitely tough. Yeah. And I had a patient who was telling me, it was funny, he was like dating now, right? He's an older gentleman, he's dating. And he was saying how now it's their children who are basically holding them hostage, holding the grandchildren hostage, being like, well, if you're going to date, then I need you to get tested. I need you to do this before you can come see your grandchild. And they're like, the roles have been reversed. Now we have to listen to our kids. And it's just so interesting because it's true. It's, you know, what, where is the risk and who wants to own that risk? Um, and I think it's just a discussion that you have, right, with your family and everybody else and decide what is best practice for you. If it's really going to be straining or emotionally an issue, for them to come and then not have contact with their grandchildren or their family, and it's just not worth that, then you can take the risk and have them, you know, unmask and be normal and still get tested later in that five-day period. Um, and hopefully they'll be negative. But if they're positive, then now all of you are going to quarantine together. So it just depends on which angle you want to go. Yeah. And, and as, as we get to warmer months, you can have some other, you know, open windows, spend more time mm -hmm. outside, you yeah. know, so th that can make it for an easier uh, 
kind of compromise. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to, you know, shift gears just a little, but you, you touched on this, your own experience. We would love to hear yeah. a lot of people in our community. I think it's safe to say have not even gotten their first dose. Um, and we just want to know what did it feel like uh, receiving both doses were your reactions different? Um, and just talk to us about that process because right now for me, it's something that I think about often. When is mm -hmm. it, when will it be time for me to get the vaccine? And then also how will I react knowing that we've had all of these discussions, but then being in that chair at that moment, yeah. I'm sure it, you know, it feels surreal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, I, that's what I would say. I mean, I felt like I felt very humbled. I felt very fortunate to be able to get vaccinated um, and to have that opportunity be given to me so early on in the process. And with my first vaccine, I felt absolutely nothing. Um, now I have very sensitive upper arms. I actually prefer to get blood draws more so than I prefer to get vaccines just because for some reason they always get sore, but it was, I didn't feel anything. They watched me for 30 minutes after my vaccine to make sure nothing happened or was it 15? I can't remember. Um, and then I was just like, wow, I, I just got a shock that I didn't think would ever happen this soon. Like it's wild, right? Um, so that was fine, no symptoms. And then my second, so I had Pfizer. So I waited three weeks for my second shot. And so for my second shot, um, where I had noticed people were getting more symptoms. So I made sure that I'd had the day, the next day, at least most of it off, just in case I had symptoms. Um, that one hurt more. My arm was much sore. Uh, and then that evening I had about, maybe 10, 15 minutes of nausea. I had a headache. Um, and then I had a little bit of, so I have, I tend to have lymph nodes and the moment like anything flares them up, they're just like, oh, we're babies, we hurt. Um, but I had a little bit of soreness. The only, and then the next day I woke up and I just took an ibuprofen and all that stuff was gone. Um, the only thing that lingered for more than a day was I had some um, lymph nodes in my armpit. So my axilla had some lymph nodes and that lasted for about two days. And that was it. It just felt like I had like put my arm on something and it was a little bit sore and that was it. So I had a relatively mild um, reaction that kind of went away with drugs the next day where I know some people had more, more chills, more fever, more body aches, um, but, and, and everyone is going to be different in their reaction. But I think, I think what it comes down to is knowing that if you do get COVID, you could get super sick and you could die. And then with the vaccine, you're not going to die. You're just going to feel maybe a little shitty for a day or so. Um, so, and it's definitely like, again, a piece for other people. Some people had really, really horrible reactions after their first and they didn't feel, they didn't know if they could tolerate their second, but more, more often than none, the people I've spoken to have gone on and gotten their second dose. And there's no real way to predict um, how you're going to react. And it's, it doesn't mean that if you have a super like tough reaction, it means your body's working and that's great. It doesn't, really mean or doesn't correlate with how many antibodies you've produced or how strong or how long your antibodies are going to last like that we don't know yet it's just more so you know that your body's working and everybody's immune system is a little bit different and and what if you um receive have no reactions does that mean it's still working yeah so again the reaction itself isn't gonna it's helpful for people to get it because then they're like, yeah, yeah, my body's kicking in. But just because you don't react doesn't mean you're not producing antibodies. Um, it's like, for example, some people are super prone to getting the cold, right? Some people get sick all the time. And then some people can have literally the exact same thing. They could be like in your face and just never get sick. And so everyone's body is just different. So it's really hard to make generalized predictions on how you react to a, a vaccine um, in its correlation for how well you're protected or how well your body's producing those antibodies. Some people and, I've heard, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and I think with Pfizer and the Moderna data, people who got the vaccine who had antibodies, some of them did not have any reactions, right? It was only a small portion of people who had reactions. Um, so still, it didn't, it didn't change that. Uh, someone asked me the other day whether or not uh, there were differences in uh, reactions between men and women. A uh, great question. Not that I have seen or not that I have data to prove. I could be wrong, but um, I 
don't think that we have clear evidence on reactions in relation to getting the vaccine. But that's a great question. Maybe we will going forward. It's so funny that we're sitting here talking about the correlations between your immune system's response to the second dose in particular, because my husband got it probably two or three weeks ago and he felt nothing. I mean, nothing. Uh, and he was like freaking out. <laughs> It was like, I heard that I'm supposed to have fever. I'm, he was like, I guess it's not working. And, I'm, and he's, you know, a physical therapist. So he has more baseline knowledge about science mm-hmm. and the way the body works than a lot of people. But even he, you could tell he was like, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm sure of the correlation and like what was supposed to happen. So I yeah. think a lot of, a lot of people are hyped up by what mm-hmm. they see and they see and they hear but we yep. all have to understand like just like covid the way our body will react to the vaccine will be different exactly everybody is but i think because of this craving for knowledge and trying to understand the vaccine we're like trying to latch on to things right like mm-hmm. trying to say okay this is what to expect with this that's going to happen to me that's not necessarily the case yeah and, and why think- would go ahead go ahead why would there be more of a reaction on the second dose? Uh, the thought is that your once your body ta- like tastes something, it's already formed a little bit of antibodies. And once you give it that second shot, it's really like, oh, I recognize this. I'm going at it. I'm going to attack it right now. Um, and that's the thought process. Mm-hmm. So that's typically why people get more of a reaction with the second dose. And I was just going to say, the battle of these symptoms is something that I've been fighting with a lot of the research participants um, because, you know, I'm doing uh, the Novavax trial and people are, are blinded, I'm blinded as in, I don't know what they're getting. They don't know what they're getting. And when people come back for their second dose, they're like, okay, I'm ready. I better have a reaction. I want a fever. I want chills. I need it. And I'm like, okay, but you might not get it. And then some of them are like, I didn't get anything. I know I got placebo. And some are like, oh yeah, I had chills for two days. I know I got the vaccine. I'm like, okay, everyone needs to chill. I don't know what it means. I can't tell you. We'll find out later. Um, but it's very interesting because the the idea is that this is something like this is something concrete that they can feel and that they want to latch onto for comfort. Like this, if I am struggling or if I'm reacting, that must mean I have something new in my body, and that's a comfort for some people. But there's going to be a lot of people who don't have any reactions that could have still gotten vaccines. So I just always find it interesting. I have a really interesting logistical question. So as a person who has not received the vaccine, how do you know which one you're getting? Do you find out when you're already in the chair or do you find out beforehand? Yeah, so most people tell you beforehand when you're scheduled, they'll say like uh, you are scheduled to get Moderna, you are scheduled to get Pfizer. Um, So most people are informed about the type that they're gonna get. And that just depends on the place, the stock, what everyone has um, and so forth. So yeah, I I think most of the time they will let you know which one you have. And you have to write it down on the card too, because they want to make sure you get the same one. Plus. Makes sense. And I know, you know, the last, uh, I guess, topic we really want to touch on has to do with just that, right? The vaccine rollout. That's been a big deal and it's been in the news. And I know Mary has a lot of questions <laughs> and we often talk about um, the rollout. So I don't know, Mary, do you want to take these set of questions? I hope I can answer. Um... Yeah, I think there, I mean, there's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions. Absolutely. <laughs> and everybody thinks that they have the solution, even though they're not in the medical field exactly. uh, or in administration to, you know, um, solve this. So, um I want, I want to, I guess my hope is that, um, you know, people are really trying to do their best Mm -hmm. and that these are really hard decisions to make. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, the slow rollout is, I, I, I guess I'm, I don't want to be naive in thinking that there's real logistical problems 
in doing something this huge. Yep. And, uh, and I am just trusting that there are good people working on this that are really trying to get us all vaccinated. Yeah, um, I mean, that would be I nice. would love yeah. to hear your, you know, since you're intimately involved in this, what is the issue with, you know, why some people, uh, you know, are not, you know, that there's, they're worried that there's not going to be enough. They're worried they're never going to get the vaccine. They're never going to have the opportunity. Um, and how can we give them hope that there will be a day when they can get it and it's not in an, a year? I mean, I think the issue is that for us, there was no strategic national rollout plan, right? It was every state kind of for itself. And depending on the state and the population, it's hard to demand from people who've never had to deal with a global pandemic um, that they would be able to do this entire coordinated effort for millions and millions of people. Like it is a huge thing to ask. Um, and so I think that's where the difficulty is. And really when you're prioritizing these things, I mean, there's a ton of questions that come up do you give it to people who are higher risk from dying or do you give it to people who are higher risk of transmitting, right? Like these are separate questions. So how do you think about that and how do you prioritize that? Do you try to find groups that are deserving of it because they are working like on it constantly and they're being exposed? Or do you take that out of the equation and focus on groups of people who are gonna be the ones that are gonna interface with the most people and therefore you want them protected, right? So the benefit of healthcare workers getting it was twofold. One, some people thought, hey, they deserve it. They're the ones dealing with this. We need to give it to them. They've worked hard. Second thought is, hey, we need our workforce to stay our workforce. We need to prevent them from getting sick. We need to prevent them from calling out of work because we need them to handle the burden of this disease. And three, they are at risk for transmitting the disease back home to their families or out into the world. So they're a high risk category because they're interfacing with sick people and healthy people, right? So all these factor, all these things factor into how to get a vaccine and who to give it to. And I think the situation was, since we don't know as much about transmission, we do want to prevent people from getting really sick and then having to go to the hospital and then adding to that healthcare burden. And so prioritizing older individuals or people with comorbidities became a more kind of clear path in how we should do that. But these are all the thoughts that go into this. And some of the stuff you don't even think about, right? You're just like, oh, I didn't even think about someone transmitting or someone deserving it or ethical or unethical. Like, how do we do this? Um, and so I think that's been the struggle. So right now in Washington, for example, we are um, vaccinating people who are older, older than 65 or people who are older than 50 who live in a multi-generational home because again there's a tier of transmission within that group right um and the with as with all rollouts things can go wrong things can go great so far in washington i believe there's about 1 million 200 thousand doses that have been given again this isn't people but the number of doses so some of those are second doses some of those are first and I think overall population wise, 11% of people have initiated with their first dose, but about 4% have completed it. And most of that's probably gonna be made of, of healthcare workers. Um, and I think that just becomes tricky. And there's obviously goals that each state is like trying to meet. So for example, right now, our average I think is about 26,000 a week and we're trying to get to like 45,000. And that's just gonna be depending on how well you can coordinate that effort. And again, some states are more experienced because they're larger, they've dealt with things like this and some states are gonna be less experienced and that's no, you know, it's no fault of their own. It's just, these things are supposed to be managed at kind of a higher level. And we just have had that lacking when this pandemic hit. And so that makes it a little bit more tricky. So I don't know if that helps answer that question, but I think, you know, all the public health people out there who are trying to make this work are doing the best they can with the information that they have and the stockpiles that they have. And we are gonna get, we're gonna make more vaccines. We'll get more vaccines. The more that more trials that we have and the more vaccines that are proven to be effective means the more options we have and the more we can give to people, right? So having Pfizer was limiting, but now we have Pfizer and Moderna, and then hopefully we'll have, you know, AstraZeneca and Novavax and all these other things to allow for that stockpile to continue and continue to grow so that we can serve the population at a faster rate. That, that helps a lot because I, as a parent who has young children, 
uh, at, I mean, teenagers, that's so young, but I want them to be in school. And, you know, one group, one of my, uh, the older kids are actually can go to school. Um, and the, my younger daughter, you know, they're, they're, they're not in school. And I can understand both sides. Mm -hmm. And the way you describe it, to me, it makes sense for us to prioritize teachers, even though the, the um, rate of infection is small, you know, that there hasn't been a lot of um, a spread in schools. We still don't have enough data. All the schools are not in full capacity operating for us to even have the data, whether or not if all the kids were there, would the teachers and students be getting sick? Um, so I can understand why, you know, they didn't go into teaching, you know, thinking they would put themselves at risk for a virus like this. So that explanation really helps me to have a lot of, I mean, I, again, I feel if people aren't comfortable, we shouldn't be requiring them to do something they're uncomfortable with because this is their health. Mm -hmm. um, but do your explanation really help to, um, because there's so many unknowns. Yeah, I think I, what I really liked about your explanation is that it's clear the competing um, calculuses that, that we have to make. We, I mean, as in the people who are in power and, and controlling the rollout. And it's not, I, I think we, we're so critical, um, but if we were in those shoes, those are really hard calculuses to make. And so the question I had that's not really you know on here, but I was just thinking about it, it's like, what have you seen in terms of positivity from working on the front lines with the vaccine rollout. For instance, what comes to mind is, uh, I know that at some sites, the vaccines, you know, uh, that they have taken out for the day, they have to use. And when they don't, they run out of people, they put a call out, right? And say, mm -hmm. we don't wanna waste these, come get these. And I think that's so positive. And you see less news reports about the positive aspects of the rollout. We know that there have been major complications. It is going uh, not as quickly as we had hoped, but I wonder if there's some value in seeing, you know, the more positive attributes of the vaccine rollout and the things, the good things that, that we are doing as people. Um, yeah. I think it's funny because I think sometimes all the positive comes out of a negative event, right? So for example, here in Seattle, a few weeks ago, uh, when a, we had a freezer malfunction at one of the hospitals and all these vaccines, there was like 1600 doses that needed to be used. And so there was a mass call out for just everybody. And this was like late at night. And it was like, come get your vaccines, hurry up. And people were pr trying to prioritize older individuals. And what you saw was in line, if people saw people who were older, they'd be like, hey, move this person up. They're older, let them get to the front of the line, let them get their vaccine. And it was very much a community effort to even though people were there and they wanted the vaccine for themselves, they recognize that the people who should be getting these vaccines might be behind them, in front of them, and that they should help prioritize these people. And this wasn't just like the workers who were doing the vaccines. It was just uh, regular people who are like, hey, this dude's like 75, get him to the front of the line, like, let's go. And it was, it's a positive thing to see. And that comes out of something negative, right? So the headline is 1600 doses of vaccine going to be wasted when it's like, but the community came together and tried to find people who should get this vaccine and tried to prioritize those people in the middle of the night in the cold. I think we need to hear those stories. Yeah, That's no, beautiful. I agree. Yeah, I yeah. think those are the stories we need to hear because it's really hard when you're inundated with the negative headlines and you're like, I'm never gonna get a vaccine. And mm -hmm. and COVID a lot of times has, has focus on the reporting of the selfish nature of people, but I do think there have been pockets of light where people yeah. are trying to do, you know, things that uh, reflect community. And so yeah. that story is like amazing. Yeah, um, I think that's great, especially when you're seeing stories of like people dressing up as old people to cut the line and get their vaccines. And you're like, but why? Yeah. You know, it's, but then and there I are- think, And I think that, you know, 
the more positive stories like that that we hear, the more we can hunker down and and stay safe and practice the uh, safety precautions that you mentioned. Because when you hear these negative, uh, oh, I'm never going to get, then you start to go, well, what's the point in all of this safety that I'm trying to do? And I'm sitting here with my friend and I'm on a mask and, you know, we're, we're even six feet apart. Why am I going to do this if all these things, yeah, I'm never going to have the vaccine. So the, mm -hmm. hearing these positive, just like warmed my heart that mm -hmm. we're going to get there. We're going to make it. We'll get there. I think so. I think it's just slow and steady. And, you know, I think some of the benefit of these trials too, is that if they show effectiveness, then it's it, people who are participating and willing to put themselves in these trials will end up getting the vaccine in the trial that they're in, um, you know, to help kind of that process along. So I think there's a lot of good that comes off, comes out of these things, even if it's buried in a lot of negative. And last question I have is, when do they have data on when certain number of people have vaccinated were going to be really on the right momentum? You mean as far as like immunity wise or just like when are we immunity gonna be satisfied? Wise. Yeah, so I mean, I think the numbers for herd immunity they were shooting for was about like 70%, but I think that becomes difficult with variants when we don't know how much immunity we're gonna get depending on what types of strains are kind of infecting people and whether the vaccines cover them. So I think that's gonna be a little bit trickier to figure out. Um, and so I don't know if we won't have those numbers until boosters are out, right? To like protect against the extra strains or not. Um, but theoretically, usually most of the time when we refer to herd immunity, we're thinking about like 70% of the population, I believe. And did they have a date for um, the boosters or not yet? Mm -mm. I think they're just like in development now. I think I have a similar question from a community member, and that's really about, we know we have our hands full with the rollout here in America, but understanding that this is a global virus and mm -hmm. the Americans are traveling, um, how is it the, the rollout going to be complicated um, when we think about the global timeline? And then also, how does the booster timeline complicate, complicate the rollout as well? Yeah. Now, I don't have much experience in the global aspect, but each you know, country is kind of navigating its own national strategy, right? Their own coordinated effort for their people. Right now, it seems like Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Chile are doing a really good job as far as getting the amount of doses out there um, and vaccinating people. Now, I don't know how many people have gotten their second doses, but a number of doses given, those are the countries that are kind of in the lead from that standpoint. And so for each area, it's just gonna depend on how their efforts go and how they're strategically doing their rollouts and whether it's beneficial for their population um, and what works for them in that way. I think the issue with boosters is it's really early on to tell how they're going to affect us because there's going to be a point where, I mean, it could depend if the variants or the strains that are not working with the vaccines end up being the predominant strains in the U.S., then maybe that focus will shift to those boosters because that's what we're going to need to protect spread, right? But if that's not the case, then maybe the focus will continue on people who just need to get their first and second doses. Um, and I think it's just too early to see how that's going to go. But at some point, there's always going to be like, should we focus on boosters? And how are we going to do that? And simultaneously still focus on getting everyone their regular vaccines. And those are going to be issues that are going to come up along the way, just depending on how things kind of pan out over the next few months. And I think, I mean, this conversation has been so wonderful. Like, I, you know, every time we talk, I have new clarity about what's going on. Um, and I think the thing that we want to end on is, again, what can we do with this information? And what can our community members do? How can we as individuals in a community just uh, help with the rollout? If there's any way, if there's anything to do besides following those tips that you gave us before, which is just, again, being cautious and, and, and you know, just uh, always being aware that the virus and the variants um, can still be easily transmitted. Yeah, I think obviously that aspect, the protection is super important. 
And I think in terms of rollout, it's really just making sure you're paying attention to when it's your turn. And when it's your turn, making sure you're telling everyone else whose turn it is to, hey, let's not sit. Because I've heard a lot of people be like, well, I'm, I can get it now, but I really just want to watch and see what happens with everybody else. Because by the time you wait and watch, it's on to the next group of people who are getting vaccinated and you're always going to be waiting. So in my opinion, I feel like once it is your turn to get that vaccine and you know, you've know you done the research, don't wait until it's your turn to think about whether you're going to get the vaccine, right? Do the work ahead of time. Talk to people that you need to talk. Get comfortable with your decision so that when it's your turn, you're like, damn, I'm ready. I'm there. And you're keeping things moving along because that's where that lag is going to come from. And I think at the same time, just being aware of like these mishaps that tend to happen, right? Staying plugged into local news, being like, oh, there's a, there's a spillage, there's extras, let's go, we're all going to CVS, get in the car, you know, like being aware of what's going on locally is helpful because then you can take advantage of the opportunities that you may not have known existed just out of happenstance. Dr. Abby, as always, it's been an education, like seriously. So we're so grateful um, and we can't wait to share <laughs> everything that you just said.